Uh, good morning, good morning, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, dele de delegates, uh, dear Dr. Frank Richter, chairman of Horasis. Uh, we are starting our session uh, dedicated to the small and medium enterprises, how to involve them into the international trade, and also how to boost supply chain uh, viability for competitive advantage. Uh, I would like uh, to introduce our distinguished speakers. Uh, we will start uh, with the. Sorry, one second. We'll, uh, we'll start with Shamik Kasirimane, uh, Director, uh, Division of on Technology and Logistics in UNCTAD, uh, United Nations Conference for the Trade and Development. Uh, for, uh, she is based in Geneva, in Switzerland. And uh, she can give us overview of the situation with the small and medium enterprises, with the e-commerce, with the prospects of digitalization, uh, with the difficulties which uh, small and medium enterprises are facing uh, in, in the activity, the good examples of development and also on the policy making. Uh, then we will give a floor to Cristiano Fibi, who is the head of strategy integral group in Switzerland. He will uh, propose us uh, one practical solution, how to involve Indian small and medium enterprises into the international trade and logistics. Uh, then we will move uh, to uh, Shrikan uh, Somani, uh, chairman and managing director of Somani Ceramics India. Uh, at the same time, he is the chair of the National Council of for small, and medium, small and Medium Enterprises in the Confederation of Indian Industries. Uh, and he will, he will give us overview from the perspective of the Indian business and the Indian policymakers. Uh, then we have another practical solution, which is Rice Exchange, which was developed by Stephen Atkins. Uh, he is based in Singapore, and uh, he will explain us how to involve Indian SME into the international trading of rice. And uh, our last speaker will be Ashok Saigal, Managing Director of Frontier Technologies. Uh, he is a Vice Chair of the SME uh, National Council in CII, Confederation of Indian Industry. And uh, as we see, we have a big presence, important presence of CII here, uh, because CII is not only an association, they are really trying to improve things and to do, they, uh, do a lot of good uh, uh, developments for the Indian business, in particular for SME. Okay, uh, my name is Murat Sietnipesov. Uh, I am the chairman uh, of Caspian Week Forum in Davos, uh, which we were doing every year except this year for the obvious re reasons. I am also president of the Greater Caspian Association, and uh, uh, we have the project to develop the Greater Caspian Region. And Greater Caspian Region is not only the five littoral states of the Caspian Sea. We are talking here about the bigger region, Caspian Sea, Central Asia, Afghanistan, up north of Pakistan, also Caucasus and the countries surrounding the Black Sea. Uh, 10 million square kilometer, 500 million people and $3 trillion GDP. Uh, okay. Uh, now I will give the floor to Shamika Simane from Yungtad, please. Thank you, Murat, and uh, good afternoon to everyone in India and to the panelists. Uh, as Murat said, I am from the United Nations organization that deals with trade and development. And let me just get to the point. And, uh, you know, so our business in, in my division, especially the bis my, our business is to help countries to cut multifaceted red tape that especially the SMEs encounter in doing international trade. And this is about time, just gathering information and procedures to export and import. And we find that, you know, it's very difficult to find information uh, if you want to export and import. And there's enormous amount of time spent on, you know, getting permits and license and bribing people. And it has added uh, uh, enormous amount of burden to uh, SMEs. And, uh, and getting logistics, I think this is one of the things that we will hear more from the other speakers too, getting logistics right has been an enormous burden. So what happens at the end is many a times SMEs would not dare get into international trade. I have spoken to, you know, for example, in Cambodia, I have spoken to farmers and they would rather sell their uh, uh, rice to the Vietnamese or the Thai 
uh, trucks coming through the uh, uh, in, in the night coming through the border rather than going through the enormous amount of barriers uh, to trade even though the rice is extreme high quality i think we will hear a lot more on this issue so only so much smes can do alone you know smes by virtue of the f- the fact is you know they are small so they don't have much power especially in a big country like india it's so much smes can do but coming together as an sme national council then you have a lot more power to deal with governments because many of the uh, many of the barriers to trade cannot be you know addressed by the private sector it has to be a private public partnership to address many of these barriers and the way that smes can do this thing the way we have seen things getting done is the when smes come together and also in the sme organi- sme uh, uh, like uh, your national council uh, you know figures that it is uh, it is time spending with the public sector is a good thing because in many cases we also find the private sector after a couple of times talking to governments they just throw their hands up and say ah oh, this is just a waste of our time we know we have no time but i think that's a mistake you have to be engaged but as a council so what do you need to do i mean i'm talking as murat said you know we have done this work across the world because we are a global body we are in asia and africa latin america and so forth in developing countries so i'm going to give you a couple of good practices that we have seen that you can take forward uh e- engage in the ppp private public forums and one of the biggest one is a national trade facilitation committees everybody has to have a national trade facilitation committee as a part of an agreement that countries have agreed with the wto the world trade organization they are all agreed to the trade facilitation agreements and one of the things is the national trade facilitation committee and this is the main committee that is supposed to address the red tape all forms of red tape so it's extremely important that you as an organization as a, as a, as a union or the council or sme association participating in this national trade facilitation committees and you need to i think murat you mentioned you need to call for digital solutions i think it has to be a very big noise from this council the vo- the aggregated voices of smes calling for digital solutions let me give you one digital solution extremely important is the customs automation and followed by other trade procedures automation of all kinds of licenses so for agriculture the i don't know permits from the health ministries it's extremely important for these to to be uh, uh uh in one place so as a trader you do not go to 25 different offices and just waste your time and come back again and for, fill many forms and start paying all kinds of people but you enter all your information in one go and this is something we have done in antad we are have automated uh, customs in 100 developing countries the neighboring all your neighboring countries are, are, are have been helped uh, by ankad and we also have created this thing called single window it's just one shop place for the trader to enter all information so the agriculture ministry the customs the industry they all take care of things and you pay uh, to the platform so you don't have to deal with many forms of bureaucracy so it's extremely important that you call for digital solution and one of the other solutions that we have found very important is the thing called trade information portals if you go to antad website and look at these things we have done these things in like a 40 countries and the trade information portal is a one stop place for the trader to go and find out how many millions of um, no how, how many hundreds of forms you have to pull where to go how much to pay uh, and this is an extremely important endeavor and what you countries have also done is once they have their trade information portal they can see that they have to for example some countries to 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 export their coffee they have to comply 60 steps and they they look at the neighboring countries export requirements they need only 20 steps and then the what the what the countries have done is to take this smes organizations would take this to the national trade facilitation committees and say hey why are we doing 60 steps and paying enormous amount of money when the neighboring country is doing exporting coffee and they have only 20 steps and they do it in two days 
and we have to do it. You know, it takes us 30 days and it has worked. You know, when you showcase these things to governments, listen, what is our competitor doing and how can we compete and that circumstances and the governments start working. So please look into trade information portals. And then just lastly, I think the, the e-commerce is an extremely important uh, uh, endeavor. And I think that I think Murat, you mentioned when we met last time, this is where you can really I can if I want Assam tea, I should be able to order Assam tea on Friday and it is being delivered to me during the weekend or whatever. So you can cut all the middlemen and capture value at the farmers. But to get there, there's a huge horde hurdles. You need to be able to have some digital skills, you know, not extremely, you know, doing a PhD in ICT. But you need some digital place to create your platform and, you know, keep uh, uh, the, your activities going. You need e-payment system. And there are extremely good examples of e-payment systems in Africa. And I think Asia should learn from Africa in this. I think Kenya, M-Pesa is an extreme good example. And I think Africa is much ahead of Asia in the e-payment systems. And you need to have legal regulatory frameworks in place. You need to insist your governments to do that because otherwise there is no trust in on internet transaction. I would not trust to put my credit card if I am not sure that this country has consumer protection, data privacy, digital signature, you know, a few of the, uh, of the reg legislation. And this is something that you need to request your governments. And one last thing is the logistic network. You know, I mean, yes, I can call, I can order uh, a tea from Assam uh, uh, a producer, but the small producers will not be able to deliver this to me in 24 hours. So you need a logistic firm, for either private companies doing logistics, or we have seen in Rwanda, extremely good example is the cooperatives have been formed. Among the, you know, among the traders, that they have formed their own cooperatives to do the logistics. So as a one logistic place. So all what I have to do is to just to grow my coffee and, you know, package it and the logistic company will take care of that. But it is in a cooperative manner. So it is a lot, it's a non-profit kind of thing. So I just will stop here. So are there are a lot of good examples elsewhere that uh, the Indian SMEs can learn from. And I will be very happy to answer questions. Thank you. Thank you, Shamika, for this uh, speech and uh, many, many great ideas. Uh, and I think uh, all of us, uh, we need uh, to get the experience which Anktat already gained. And uh, I will personally go after that for, for the website and dig everything what is available there. Uh, and uh, you are perfectly right, uh, because there are a lot of components uh, how to develop SMEs and how to involve them in the international business, uh, starting from digitalization, logistics, platforms. Uh, recently, we had discussion also during the World Economic Forum meeting about the development of the platforms, and not only B2C, which everybody knows now, like Alibaba, Amazon, and so on, but also B2B, B2G, G2B, and the G2G. Uh, it's a... <laughs> where this kind of platform, this is the future. This is the future because traditional trading, which is based on the technology from British Empire, 19th century, original bills of lading and so on, will disappear. It's already anachronism, as per my view. Uh, now I would like uh, to give the floor to Christiana Phoebe. Uh, uh, there was, uh, they developed a very nice uh, business model, how to connect uh, producers in the greater Caspian region with the end users worldwide via container transportation. Uh, because for containers, the minimum cargo size is only 24, 25 tons. In comparison with the traditional cargo size in the international trading, let's say from, to reach Caspian region, uh, from Caspian region to reach India, you need at least 60 or 100,000 ton vessel. And the uh, SME cannot afford to move 100,000 ton vessel, but they can afford to move a container and buy, uh, buy cargo in container loads or sell. Okay, please, Cristiano. Thank you, Murat. Um, so, yes, I would like to expand a little bit on, uh, well, let's follow from what Shamika said, and let's look at what are the limiting factors that Indian SME would face when they have to source internationally the raw materials that they need to continue their growth. 
And the very basic statement you can make is that they do not have direct access to producers. So they have to deal with very fragmented and incomplete information. They have to source information manually and very inefficiently. And then when it comes to actually uh, dealing with the quantity they need, well, it's not like they have many choices. It's either they buy from a long chain of intermediaries that will eventually give them the quantity they need, which is not, as Murat was saying, <laughs> a large career, but they will have to uh, then pay a premium for the smaller quantity and the service, or they try to bulk up and build a bigger order, and then they have to carry the storage, and of course, the price risk situation and the financing uh, complexity. Or as Shemike say, there are a few examples of purchase consortium, which are very promising, but from a political point of view, they're not very easy to build, and there's a lot of uh, um, fragility in the coordination. Now, if you look at instead the, the area that we know a little bit better, which is the Greater Caspian region, it's not that, that much dissimilar because they are rich in commodities, but they lack a structured export channel, especially for India, uh, where their commodities would be very much in need. And we're talking about fertilizers, uh, polymers, pet coke, you know, things that Indian SME would really uh, profit from if they could have a direct access. So to summarize this whole thing, you have from one end somebody who's eager to export, from the other one somebody who's eager to buy, but they cannot match because either they can't talk to each other or they can't fit the, the quantity they need. So what we uh, try to do to pioneer a little bit in the region um, is to come up with a solution that would help both parties uh, to uh, finally get in contact. And, you know, it's not... Uh, probably, like, as you say, it didn't require a PhD in ICT, but it did require some, <laughs> some work. And it's a web shop where um, exporters can get direct access to worldwide customers, which are mainly SMEs, and that ties in very well for the Indian case where the SME is the backbone of the economy, and they can get containerized goods. So we have this product, well, this product, this, this venture is called Integral Commodities. And what it does is it allows SMEs to find regional producers and they can have offers directly. They can have technical specifications and documentation of all the products. And here's the key thing. They can order small container volumes that gets delivered directly to their factory or the farm. Of course, they can see live prices. They can also do the payment part that Shamika mentioned, and they can trace the delivery, and that's done completely online. And of course, uh, as we are doing that, and we have created a network of vetted partners for inspection, logistics, and insurance, we can offer that too as well. Now, this is a very interesting project, uh, but as Shamika was saying, the logistic is very important because I can put you in contact uh, with a producer, but you'll need a containerized cargo, and what if the container logistic is not in place? <laughs> Where that is the other problem that we try to assess. For that, we had a different adventure, which is called a Caspian Container Company. So if you look at the in case specifically, the container flow in India, generally it's favorable to exports, but at times it becomes very critical. And if you see what happened in the recent months, it was really, really uh, critical. I mean, the, the container rates had spiked so much that SME uh, were pretty much incapable of exporting economically. Of course, if you have a very large company, you enjoy uh, preferential treatment from large career because of your frame agreements. If you're an SME, you're fully exposed to this price risk. And so what does that container company, uh, cont Caspian Container Company do is, thanks to integration with uh, obviously the rest of the group, it relies on a static flow of backhaul cargos and it can offer its own containers for regional exporters and it stabilizes the flow. So the advantage for anybody here is that the price is stabilized and of course it becomes cheaper we reduce any seasonality effect of the flows, 
And we can also increase the turnover of containers in regions and at moments where this can become a real issue. Now, of course, if you take a step back and you look at the whole system, the solution has also added benefits uh, because it, it enables uh, non-bulk exporters to offer less than container load uh, for quantities that can get directly delivered to customers, which they could not if the container logistics were not in place. Of course, the trades become safer and they can also become uh, easier because the container logistics uh, does work a little bit differently than moving and building up the cargoes. And then there, the fact that um, shipper-owned containers at the moment represent a real issue on an ecological and economical level would get a- addressed. Uh, just to give a very small perspective, when containers reach the greater Caspian region, they get stranded because there's no cargo coming back. So they just stay there and rust. And we're talking about something around 100,000 containers sitting idle in the region. Containers that are completely excluded from the world's container flow. And they need to be replaced with new ones, which increases cost, but also it's unnecessary consumption of resources, iron, energy, chemicals, uh, work. It's, to be honest, also not negative for just for the, the economics, but also for the climate change uh, issues that we're dealing with more and more. So these are the way we're approaching the, the issue that uh, we're talking about. And for both initiatives, actually, we're kind of pioneering a little bit uh, the effort, um, but we're doing it uh, with good spirit, uh, with venture spirit. Therefore, we're more than happy uh, to uh, hear from anybody and uh, to expand our network and to partner with anybody that is happy to grow uh, either the integral commodities or the Caspian Container Company capabilities. Uh, thank you, Cristiano. Uh, I would like to add here that in today's uh, uh, today's world, as less intermediaries in the chain you have, uh, as the more sustainable is the chain itself, because uh, there's a less probability of the disruption. Uh, in in such approach, like uh, B2B platforms and via container logistics, uh, in logistics side is door-to-door delivery. It means no any intermediaries in the middle. On the trading side, also producer to end user, and uh, with this approach, like all intermediate, could be 20, 25 companies normally staying in the middle, traders, big traders, or takers, and so on. They are removed from the exercise, and by that, where uh, supply chain will be really stabilized. Just one small comment from my side. Uh, thank you, Christiana, for the interesting idea and the uh, interesting business model. Now I would like uh, to invite uh, Shikan Somani, uh, who is the chairman of the SME National Council in the Confederation of Indian Industry, uh, to express his views on the on this problem and uh, his ideas how to de- to develop SME sector in India and how to involve them in the, into the international trade, international business. Your microphone is on mute, uh, Shikan. Your microphone is on mute. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Murad. Uh, it's lovely to be here on this panel with this August gathering and, uh, and listening to the uh, the past two speakers have been very um, uh, exciting as well as uh, knowledgeable, I think. Uh, but let me give you a perspective uh, rather than com- coming to the problems is that where do we stand? I think this is this is the most important thing that we need to understand. And, and, and in the Indian perspective, as I see, I don't know if you know, but uh, these are figures, they're already there, that we have 65 million uh, M- MSMEs in India who are actually uh, employing 120 million people. So that's, that's, that's when, you, when you talk of the backbone, I think this truly makes the backbone for, for the Indian economy. Specifically, 40% of the exports are going from MSMEs. 42% of DGP is coming from the MSMEs. So it's not a small matter. And over the years, these industries, however much have been in the focus, but they've never seen the kind of uh, uh, importance as we've seen in the last five, six years. 
specifically starting from the first instance of the definition of MSMEs. Now here we work, we, we work with the government as, as uh, uh, Shamika was saying that advocacy was the government very important as far as SME is concerned. Yes, truly so, because we moved uh, heaven and earth to find out what are the possibilities. And finally, we got this, that the MSMEs now can see that there is a growth prospect. So unless and until you see the growth prospect and MSME is growing from small to big to medium, and when you don't, when you have to compare yourself with MSMEs abroad, we will know where. Today we can say with the 250 crore uh, uh, industry being an MSME, you can say that any of the middle stand, the small middle stand, or companies in Korea and companies in Japan, we can there there is a there is some sort of a comparison. Now, when we talk of MSMEs, and I think this is the most important thing when we talk of, let me take you what, what, what COVID has done. I think people say COVID has been a disaster. Yes, but I think COVID also has been a catalyst. And catalyst in the way that people have started thinking in different, the mindsets have changed, the business models have changed. Um, the the geo trade policies within uh, between countries has changed and that has given a huge opportunity to countries where there is a big mass of uh, MSMEs, for example, India. And you have every category of industry which is contained in MSMEs today. Now, here is an opportunity to say, what is it that we need to do to bring MSMEs into the global supply chain? And what are the difficulties they would face? There are internal difficulties, there are external difficulties. And I think we, we need to balance these equations to make them suitable and, and, and industry-wise, we can say. So my approach would be to say that you have industry clusters. There are, there are these low-hanging fruits of clusters of industries which are already there and can be made into a fruitful global supply chain companies and what do we need to do there so if, if we take those uh, those those a few industries maybe 20 30 uh, you know the uh, automobile industry is already there the textile industry is already there there are other engineering industries there are other farm industries which could be brought in so we need to also look at the how diverse we can make the clusters which are today prepared and can be moved into the supply chain. And what do we need to do? So where I see the, the hindrances are one, technology. I think we need, uh, the Indian SMEs would need technology, partnerships to bring about change in their workings. Secondly, we need digitization. I think this is the, this is the hour of the day. This is the new norm of business, which is, which, which has ushered in this uh, in, in these 18 months or so of COVID, which probably probably would have taken more than five years to happen, it has happened in 18 months, and I think this is this is the this is the opportunity where we could we look at digitization of the Indian MSMEs to move them into the space where where they, their efficiencies are increased, their entire output is increased, the whole outlook is increased because. Tomorrow, when they are going to work with uh, industries abroad, the first question they're going to ask is, are you, are you working with digital processes? So this is, this is something where we need to do this. And uh, while we are doing this, from, let me tell you from the, from the basis of uh, uh, the CII, we are doing a lot of work in this. We have, we have various uh, programs where we handhold uh, the the, uh, the SMEs to bring them up to speed and take them through the digitization processes. These are very, very important things that I see have to be done. One of the solutions that, of course, uh, as far as the advocacy with government is concerned on the ease of doing business, I said this is this is an hindrance as far as as far as business is concerned. While we talk of uh, ease of doing businesses, but the actual transition towards the real ease of business does not take place as easily as it should. So I think there's a lot of work that we need to do in terms of the ease of doing business for, for, for specifically for MSMEs. 
Of course, it, it, it gets expanded to the larger industries. But since we are talking of MSMEs here today, I think this is one very important factor that we need to look at. Logistics. I think this is the competitiveness of any industry depends largely on the cost of logistics as well. Huge. So how do we bring in digitization to map where spaces are there? How costs can be brought down? Cristiano's uh, the, the, the company which is doing on basis of it's a very interesting uh, uh, idea, Christiana, and I would like to m um, uh, learn more about this to say how we can bring it into the Indian prospect and how we can work with you. So uh, CII's National Council will be extremely happy to connect people uh, within our organization to say the, how you can use that because we are looking at the first and foremost thing that we are looking at is competitiveness. Unless and until you are competitive, you cannot go out in the world to supply. And when you're talking of competitiveness, it takes care, it, it brings into various aspects of raw material, of logistics, of finance, of trade costs, of, of barriers. All these come into play. And so we, I see that there is a great opportunity for world organizations like yours and others, to work together. And we'd be very happy to do that, to see how we can bring it, uh, bring it as close as possible to at least a few of these industries to bring them into the global supply chain. I think I'll need to stop here because there's a lot of more questions. Perhaps on the question and answer, we bring up a few more things. But from my perspective, I think there's a lot of work that we need to do from our end here. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Shrikant. And uh, actually, uh, the activity, as I already told, activity of CII is really amazing. And uh, I'm now thinking how to implement such ideas in the Greater Caspian region, uh, with the, also with the chambers of commerce and maybe on the regional level also, because uh, a lot yeah. of things could be really implemented. Uh, uh, we have, Murat, we have a very, very good programs for MSMEs in CII, which we are doing. And we'd be very happy to share. Thank you. Thank you, Shikan. Now I would like uh, to invite Stefan Atkins. Uh, he's the uh, founder and CEO of the Rice Exchange. Uh, and here I think also there is a potential to involve SMEs, uh, farmers, uh, into the international business uh, through such exchanges and uh, such platforms. Please, Stefan. Your microphone, please. Thank you very much, um, Murat. With, with your permission, I'd like to change the title of this forum a little bit and call it Boosting Supply Chain Visibility for Competitive Advantage, because I think uh, that's the starting point to, uh, to any fundamental changes that we want to make. Uh, Rice Exchange is present in over 30 countries around the world. Um, we have buyers of rice in the United States, in Europe, in... Um, in Southeast Asia uh, and in Africa, as well as the Middle East. And uh, what those buyers want when they're buying rice is they want to know, number one, is it what they agreed? And where does it come from? And, and probably how was it grown? And the only way to do that effectively is to have a proper database of, um, of producers and to have proper certification of how that rice was produced. And I mean, moving on then to, from a marketplace perspective, I, I think we all agree it's difficult for a small producer to directly trade with a buyer in another country. Um, I think it will happen, um, but I think there's an intermediate step, which is when, um, uh, let's say the mill where the rice has been milled has a record of where the rice was produced and can certify that. And then in the context of our platform, the surveyors or the inspection companies are able to confirm um, the veracity of those statements and those certificates. And so what we have is we have a blockchain-based audit log where those certificates are uploaded by the inspection company. Everybody else involved in the transaction can review it. They can check that certificate versus a database. We have an agreement in place with SRP, which is the Sustainable Rice Platform, uh, which is the UN-backed um, initiative for uh, verifying the stability of how rice is produced. The inspection company then is is, is the um, what we would call the source of truth. 
um, around the connecting the certificate to the rice. So what, in the end, what the buyer is able to do is they're able to connect all of those pieces of information. Once you do that, then you can have a proper marketplace where people are rewarded for growing rice in a sustainable or organic way. They're, they're, they see that they can get a premium because buyers have confidence in a certification. We're seeing even, I mean, we, we started Rice Exchange uh, in development three years ago. Even three years ago, there was comparatively little demand from uh, supermarkets in Europe and the US for sustainable grown rice or, or certified rice, whereas it was obviously already big in coffee and cocoa. Now that's totally different. Or, or nearly all the supermarkets are demanding that there be some form of certification on the rice that's being sold. Um, the question is, how do you give them a solution which, which really um, gives them the, the, the trust both to, um, to, to make that commitment to their, to their buyers to charge more and also to have enough supply available, right? And that's really where we come in, helping producers to get certified such that they can um, be one of the suppliers to those, uh, to those uh, buyers. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, I think uh, such platforms uh, uh, are very important uh, for development of the business and specifically for SME because uh, uh, here, uh, let's say you are the Indian farmer, you are producing rice, how you are going to export it? You need to go and uh, sell at the cheap price to some uh, local of takers and so on. But here you can really have direct access to the market. Uh, now, uh, I would like uh, to invite Ashok Saigal. Uh, he's a co-chair of uh, SME National Council of CII in India. And after his speech, we'll give uh, time, a little bit time for the question of the audience. I see there is a question from Mahesh. Uh, I don't see his family name. He's, uh, he has a microphone, but after Mr. Saigal speech. And uh, we discussed uh, with Ashok uh, during the last days, there were very interesting ideas, for example, how to involve banks in financing uh, of SME, SMEs, and there was a very interesting experiment which you did. I, I really liked it. And uh, also uh, competition between the states in India. This is also a very good initiative. And uh, when the states are trying to show to others how competitive they are to attract business, to develop business, and uh, and also other ideas w w w which you mentioned during our discussion. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Murad. Thank you. thank you. First of all, uh, let me say that many of these ideas originate uh, with Mr. Sobani, and particularly on global supply chains. And uh, he is really behind global supply chains and digitization. So a lot of it is with his support and his interest in these areas. Um, I think I'd like to go back to what Stephen said, which was very, very insightful and very interesting. He said that the, we have to improve not the uh, supply chain viability, but the visibility. And the visibility must come before the viability. Only then the viability can come. Um, I think as we look at it from India, and it has also been mentioned by uh, Shamika and others, is that India is seen to have tremendous potential. But I think we've been seeing that potential for the last 20 years, and everybody is now asking, when does that potential become reality? I think the time has now come when we're approaching that stage to convert that potential into reality. So a lot of things have happened. And again, uh, going back to some of the ease of doing business matters, which Shamik also uh, referred to, I just want to share a small thing that now when import consignments come into India, you can, or you, you not only can, you're required to file your bill of entry at least 48 hours in advance. And the customs people will accept your declaration of what is your estimate of the duty, you pay it in, and within 24 hours, they will give you a response whether they accept it or they dispute it. So you've paid that amount. When your consignment lands within two days, you can have it in your factory if it's come by air, and that is our practical experience. I want to contrast that with uh, a small shipment that we had to send urgently to a customer in China. And when we were discussing with him the flight timings and the arrivals, he said that it would take him four days from Shanghai Airport to get into his factory. So, so that's where we stand in terms of efficiency, where we think China is doing this very efficiently. We are not behind, we perhaps have a step ahead. Um, so 
the we're talking about uh, the viability for competitive advantage so i think here the main point is that what are the competitive advantages that we in india offer to any potential buyer i think the first and foremost compared to other countries who are uh, also in the export and international market is the language that we have communication is much easier with us most of our business enterprises in english and that is a big facilitator and something we do take and we should take more advantage of that uh, again linked to that is the transparency uh, i think many of you have visited india and you will you will agree that you can walk into any part of india talk to your customer see things for sale which is not always possible in many, in several other countries which also try to be competitive suppliers in the global market the third thing is that over the last 10 or 15 years i think india has established itself as capable of producing technically sophisticated and good products of which the example of apple phones is one the space exploration we've been doing sending up as many as 80 satellites on one booster rocket and so on so on other kind of things which have created credibility for indian suppliers that did not exist in the 90s so so that is something else which we can leverage the third thing is the proximity to europe with of course all the shipping constraints which are now happening which cristiano spoke about and the freight rates going totally haywire as far as msmes are concerned i think uh, we are paying about 10000 dollars to ship a 40 foot container from india to europe uh, when the goods in that container may be 40 or 50000 dollars so you're talking of perhaps as much as 20% being added due to freight costs so 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 that is something that we have to address also uh, touching upon uh, the aspect you said of what we did uh, for banking during the covid pandemic the concept of a finance facilitation week of a fin- uh, finance mobilization week was uh, mooted by the cii secretariat and we had a one week long uh, program where msmes could come in and say this is the kind of financing we're looking from banks we had a panel of 25 to 30 banks and we facilitated the msmes to put their applications in the format which were bankable where was the missing information where were things which were not fitting into a financing pattern and we had uh, within that one week not a very large percentage but we had about 3000 applications and 300 of them were accepted and disbursed as loans now i think two things one is that already right, small percentage but the other side i think a lot of the people were able to understand why their proposal was not bankable and therefore they should look for alternative ways of financing rather than waiting for a decision which is the worst thing which can happen to any small business you're waiting hoping and it doesn't happen so these are the kind of things i think uh, which we have been doing and uh, i mean we could, as we had a long chat the other day we can continue in the future i'm very happy but this is an overview of the kind of movement which is taking place in india as a whole and msmes and how we in cii are facilitating this move forward for msmes thank you uh thank you ashok i would just like i would like to comment that uh, 300 approved application from 3000 application it's a very good result for today don't tell us <laughs> very low rate <laughs> because banks now extremely conservative is extremely difficult to handle uh okay uh we have uh, one uh, two minutes remained and uh, we have one question uh from mr mahesh koteka ceo of structured credit international corporation uh if you are in the room i will give you the floor now one second Please. Sure. Murat, I appreciate the excellent conversation about uh, uh, about supply chains and uh, the role of SMEs. My question is uh, on the point just made by CII on financial financing of SMEs to increase supply chains a very important uh, goal for the post pandemic world where supply chains had been stressed. Uh, in the pandemic i would like to know what additional work is work agent banking which has extended access to the unbanked 
in the informal sector? Are there things happening in India in the financing of uh, of SMEs and and, and the excluded the informal sector? Thank you. Uh, did you get fully the question? Because there was some interruption in the connection. Uh, or we can ask uh, Mr. Mahesh to repeat. Very concisely, it's a question of what is happening in India with respect to financial. It looks like on, on, on the word financial, everything has been blocked all the time. <laughs> so, yeah. no. Okay, uh, Ashok, who would reply? I think we can split the uh, answer with uh, uh, Ashok and myself. What, what Mr. Uh, Mahesh has asked us is what is, the, what, what is happening other than what CII has done? Uh, CII always keeps pushing the government as far as uh, uh, the, the requirement. They bring to speed to the government to say that what is the requirement and what are the problems that the, CI, uh, the MSMEs face. But on the other hand, I must say the government is aware of the difficulties and various bank schemes have already been put into place where, where the MSMEs could, uh, could, which would help the MSMEs to tide their problems uh, specifically when they are uh, uh, during these uh, COVID difficult COVID times, when their businesses were not operating, when the OEM manufacturers, uh, their, their their principal suppliers had had their plants stopped, but the banks have come in for with various uh, various uh, schemes. Um, I wouldn't like to go ahead with the number of schemes that they, uh, that they have brought in, but they are very uh, useful and they have been taken care of as far as the MSMEs are concerned. So the, the banks and the Indian government is quite aware of the fact and the needs of the MSME. Now, Maheshi, I'd like to uh, address the specific point you said of those which are not presently banked. I think that was one of the focus points of your question. Um, I think recently there has been an interesting uh, development. I don't know if you are aware of that. That, uh, you see, there is for the banks, most of the banking sector in India is controlled by the government. And there is a target given to them of what is called priority sector lending. Now, this priority sector lending includes lending to industry and specifically MSMEs and specifically within that subsets of women and scheduled castes. Uh, schedule, you, you would understand some of the other members. Anyway. So now, uh, in the recent uh, one or two months, what has been included is that non-banking financial companies have also been classified as recipients of priority sector lending. So the nationalized banks, the regular banks, if they lend to a non-banking financial company, that also counts to as a quota of priority sector lending. And as you know, non-banking financial companies work in a more informal way. They don't have so much paperwork and they generally reach out to the smaller end of the industrial segment and individual entrepreneurs. So that's been a major step forward, for instance, in reaching the unbankables. The other is a scheme which has been around for perhaps two years called the Mudra scheme, where up to rupees 10 lakhs are given to anybody almost who approaches a bank with any reasonable project. And uh, that much money can be given to him as, as a working capital loan with, with almost no paperwork or conditions required. The third one is a 59-minute scheme where people who are in a more regular system can apply online and onto this portal, put in your income tax return, put in your sales tax return, and based on these two factors, within 59 minutes, you'll know whether your proposal is accepted or not. So these are some of the steps on the financial side, which, which are working and, and have been recent steps. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, one uh, more short question, uh, which which is not exactly related to SMEs, but I think uh, w w we can ask. Uh, from uh, Raghav Kanoria from Switzerland, uh, how do we see pricing of technology from an Indian perspective? Uh, for example, industrial robotics are expensive and labor is re relatively cheaper. Very short answer, please. No. I, can answer, I, I can answer this very quickly. It is completely relative to the industry. If, if the industry is a high-tech industry where the cost doesn't matter, then robotics to bring, down, uh, to bring in efficiency and quality of packing is, or otherwise, 
is important and they don't bother but it all depends on the product that you are in and the and the relative uh, need with the the cost against the uh, uh, the the, uh, the the cost against the the efficiency so for example in 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 a tile industry where 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 we are we we are operating we found that robotics are far too expensive than the manual labor that we are using and they are doing an equally good job and fast enough so therefore you have to actually balance the equation according to what your industry is so that's the only answer it doesn't matter what the cost is yes technology cost is always higher and it will always remain high but then there's always a trade off of what you are earning against uh, that and what is your payback period so that's the short answer thank you shakan uh, okay uh, we are already uh, five minutes over the limit uh, but nevertheless i think uh, we did a good job today and uh, thank you very much for your time and your contribution to the session and se- special thanks uh, to dr frank richter chairman of horasis uh, for organizing uh, horasis india meeting and providing us with this possibility to talk and express our opinions how to develop smes in india and worldwide thank you very much and uh, let's meet till the next meeting hopefully the next meeting will be live of horasis thank you thank, thank you. you thank you very much thank, thank you. you all the best thank you